Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Messages of Hope. And there's nothing that can give a grieving person more hope than the thought that the afterlife is real. I know it is. And my guest today knows that as well. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mark Ireland. Thank you, Suzanne. Great to be here again. Yes, it is the second time you've been on the show, but I don't know that we did video last time. So I like this much better. This this uh, People have a choice to listen on normal podcast platforms or on my YouTube channel. So for those of you who don't know Mark and didn't listen to our last interview, he is the co-founder of Helping Parents Heal. He's also an expert on the afterlife, and he has a certification program for mediums, which we'll talk about in this hour together and so much more. So if you have any doubt that the afterlife is real, we hope we'll dispel a good deal of that today. Mark, why don't you tell us how and why you got into this field? Because it's not your main vocation, correct? No, it's not how I <laughs> pay my bills, but um, it is something I grew up with. So I think, you know, in terms of my understanding of the afterlife and mediumship, psychic phenomena, all these wonderful things really started with my childhood because my father was a prominent psychic and medium back before it was popular, you know, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s range. Um, and he started out. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. What was his first name and was that his main vocation? His name is Richard Ireland. And yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, I would say the earliest uh, evidence of his abilities in talking to my grandmother was when he was about three years old because they lived in rural Ohio, didn't have a telephone or any, you know, TV or anything. And he always knew when grandpa was coming. And so <laughs> he, he got to be so good at predicting when people were coming, they would actually cook meals based on his predictions. Oh, no kidding. And at the it's my first five, goosebumps and we're just getting going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When he was five years old, they took him to the uh, Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, for corrective surgery on his eyes because he was born cross-eyed. And after the surgery was completed, they had his eyes cupped and bandaged. And the nurse, they'd actually tied him down to a bed, restrained him because they were afraid he'd take the bandages off. This nurse felt sorry for him, and, and he said he promised not to touch the bandages that she let him up. So she did. She went on about her rounds, came back later found him bouncing a ball against the wall and catching it. She thought, oh, my God, he's taking the bandages off. But even scarier to her, he hadn't. Oh, man. So then she called in these other doctors to observe this strange kid. And then they performed a variety of different experiments on him, like putting him in a bed and having one doctor at the foot of the bed and another in the doorway saying, who's in front of you now and stuff like that. And And he aced it. So that was, you know, the early goings on. And then at the age of 13, he did his first kind of public demonstration in a, in a circle at a spiritualist church. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of his entry point. And he, he was mentored by another a spiritualist minister at the time. And he uh, ended up uh, getting his ordination papers at the age of 17. He was a, a minister in the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. Wow. Um, and he did that for a number of years. He was in that circle being a, like a traveling minister, demonstrating his phenomena and gifts of the spirit, mediumship, everything for a number of years. And that's how he met my mom in 1956. And then I came along, you know, a few years later and uh, grew up with this. And it was just second nature in our household. The psychic stuff, definitely all the time. You couldn't get away with anything. Oh. <laughs> but I think the thing that touched me the most at a young age was in public demonstrations, observing him giving, um, maybe he'd be doing psychic work and then spontaneously give a, a spirit message to somebody with great specificity and names and first and last names sometimes and who what they did for a living and maybe how they knew each other and just stuff. And I could see how much it touched those people and, and they'd start tearing up. And I always remembered that. And really what brought me back to it, even though I'd kind of lived the mainstream lifestyle and I got married at a young age, didn't seek to be like my dad, went into the business world, but my youngest son, Brandon, passed at 18. And that was really the catalyst that made me look back on my dad's life and what I had observed as a kid and, and kind of reinsert myself into that with great interest and enthusiasm. Wow. I want to talk more about Brandon as we go along, but did you have... Any time in your life when you were embarrassed by what your dad did because mediumship 
especially decades ago, was more taboo than, than it's becoming accepted now? Or was it just so normal that you didn't even worry about skeptics? Uh, in the household, I never worried. Uh, externally, I was proud of him. I took friends to go see him and stuff like that, <laughs> his demonstrations of, of phenomena. And the only time when I was really, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but just um, would be frustrated was I've talked to somebody who was skeptical or wouldn't be open to it or whatever. And then I just say, well, you have to see it for yourself, you know, or in that kind of a thing. But um, never was I embarrassed. I was proud of my dad and the work That's that he awesome. did and all the lives he touched. That's awesome. Do, are there any videos on YouTube of him doing his work? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the best one I have is him doing a psychic demonstration on the Steve Allen show in 1971. It's on YouTube. Okay. And when I give my site information out, there's a link to it right on my website. Why don't you give it right now? So Okay. It's MarkIrelandAuthor.com, Mark with a K, Ireland like the country, author, MarkIrelandAuthor.com. And on that one site, so it's kind of a one-stop shop, you'll not only see my stuff, my books and information, but you'll have a link to my dad's videos, a link to his site, a link to Helping Parents Heal, which I'm sure we'll touch on, um, and also a link to my certified mediums site, which we'll probably touch on too. Um, and a lot of other stuff. But those three things, you could just go to that one site and find links to all those there. Wonderful. I, I'd like to go to Brandon's passing because I seem to recall that your uncle, your dad's brother, also had this ability. And he's the one that validated that even after Brandon passed it, almost immediately, he, he knew he was okay. Is that right? Yeah, so Brandon passed um, while climbing the McDowell Mountains in Scottsdale, Arizona, behind our home at the time. Um, we didn't know the cause of death when it happened. We, you know, I just talked to his buddy, um, and his buddy said, you know, he had complained about um, his heart beating rapidly or his arms were kind of numb, um, and the authorities wouldn't tell us anything until we got an autopsy uh, later that week. It was actually uh, three. the third day I was in the mortuary making arrangements and I connected with my uncle by phone. By this time, my dad had already been gone a number of years, but my uncle had similar abilities and uh, we connected and he said, hey, Mark, I've got something to share with you. He said, last night I tried to connect, but I just couldn't get anything. But this morning I was doing my meditation as I start every morning and your your dad came to me. And he wanted you to know um, he was there when Brandon crossed over and he Brandon was a little confused, didn't know what was going on with your dad, helped him adjust. Um, and he, Brandon wanted you to know that you're the best parents you ever could have had, which is the nice, warm, fuzzy thing we like to hear. But then I got the evidence after that. He said Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen in his bloodstream that caused his heart to fail. Two days later, uh, the autopsy physician calls me and said, you know, Sorry about this, but your son's death was caused by an asthma attack that drove his blood oxygen levels down, causing cardiac arrest. So I got the cause of death two days before from my uncle. Um, and that was one of the earliest, you know, things that really brought great comfort to the family and also uh, really um, pushed me down this path even more. Um, even I think even before that, I did something on my own, wanting a direct connection. It was probably day one or two days after. And I decided to go into a darkened room, which was actually a walk-in closet, turn off the light, sit down, quiet my mind, and just ask for a connection. And within a reasonable period of time, I saw Brandon's face scroll by my mind's eye, smiling and glowing, actually glowing and feeling joyful. And I thought, oh, that's great. I didn't expect anything more. And then right after that came a symbol. And it was a cross with an oval loop at the top. I'd seen people wear those, but I didn't really know what they symbolized. So then me not knowing the meaning, I had to go Google it to find out. And I looked it up. It turned out to be the Ankh, which is the oldest cross of human history, dating back about 5,000 years to the Egyptians. And it symbolizes the lower portion, the cross, physical life, and the oval loop, eternal life. Hmm. So I was given a puzzle to put together that was pretty awesome because if I had already known what that symbol meant, I would have said, oh, my subconscious is just trying to make me feel better. So those were really the first two things. That plus my uncle's affirmation really catapulted me down that path. Wow. Excellent evidence. And, and it is interesting that you didn't 
seem to pick up your dad's ability, but when you needed it, there it was. I've had flashes of it over the years, but it's not something I really focused on doing or practicing. Um, and some of them have been quite remarkable. Um, it's just, I guess, first off, I'm I'm not my dad. I'm <laughs> We're just different pers personalities. I'm probably more pragmatic and careful and conservative, where he was more carefree and spur of the moment kind of guy. And I felt like his standard was so high. How could I ever measure up to that? If you're yeah, Michael that's... Jordan's son, do you want to follow his footsteps, you know, playing basketball? But I have had some remarkable things happen. I know that it's there kind of in latent form. And when I try to use it, it, it can be pr productive. Well, I feel very strongly, especially for so many people that are studying mediumship these days, that it is a calling and that we all can have those flashes, like you say, and some meaningful connections with our own loved ones. But if it's something your soul came here to do, you'll just know it. And clearly it wasn't your calling, but you have that ability. Yeah, I think um, I think part of it, too, is just I see uh, it's a lot of responsibility to read for people in grief. So you've got to be really, really good. And no one's going to be perfect all the time. It, I know it ebbs and flows and the connection varies from person to person that you're who's your sitter. But nonetheless, you know, I think having a high standard, I would have to have a very high standard for myself where I've te I've practiced a lot and felt like I can really do this nine times out of 10 at a high level. Otherwise, I would not put myself in that situation, not for my, my own ego, but for the people that I'm reading for. Well, I hope that's how all professional mediums uh, think and feel. And th those are the standards we hold ourselves to. And I love that you have this certification program and hold mediums to that standard for helping parents heal the organization you co-founded. Why don't you talk first about the organization, then we'll go into the certification process. Yeah, let me go all the way back to how it started because it's kind of interesting. So I was doing an event to promote my first book, Soul Shift. This is probably 2009, 2010. And um, so at this workshop, I'm doing, I'm talking and I'm working with another medium friend, Jamie Clark, and we take a break. And during the break, a woman approaches me. Her name is Suzanne Wilson. And she says, hey, um, I wanted you to know I'm I just moved to Arizona from Florida and I came to your event because I wanted to meet like-minded people. She says, I'm actually a medium already. I said, oh, great. She says, ironically, because I talked about how Brandon had passed on a mountain. She says, I recently met a woman whose son was also on a mountain when he passed. And it's just kind of ironic. And I said, you know what, why don't you give her a copy of my book? And uh, here's my contact info and just, it might help her. So it wasn't a day or two later, I get a call from Elizabeth Boyson and she says, uh, hey, Mark, I wanted you to know I read your book like in one sitting. or It was really, she read it like in a day or something. She says, I loved it. And I'd love to meet you and your wife. So we made arrangements to get together. And a short time later, she said, hey, I've put together a Facebook group called Parents United and Loss. And it's just been online, but I'm going to have my first in-person you know, meeting in a couple of weeks. Would you be my first speaker? And I said, yeah. sure. So I came to that first event and I spoke. It went pretty well. We had 30, 40 people there. And then she started doing those monthly. Well, fast forward to 2011. Um, I was leaving a corporate job trying to decide what I wanted to do next. And another medium friend, I keep meeting mediums, <laughs> uh, Tina Powers from Tucson. She said, Mark, you know, I think your real, your real purpose in life is to help other parents who have been through the same thing you have. Maybe you consider starting an organization to do that. So I said, okay. And I kind of mulled that over and I thought, why reinvent the wheel? I mean, Elizabeth has something here that works and it's good, but it's the, sh the only shortcoming is she doesn't have a website. She doesn't have a newsletter and it's only one location. Hmm. So I thought, so I called her and I said, hey, would you want to work together on taking this thing to another level and rebranding it? Um, so for one thing, I could help you build a website put a newsletter out and then um, blueprint what you do in your meetings and then have affiliate chapters start popping up in other locations. And, and maybe we could rename it to something like helping parents heal. And she goes, Oh, I love that name. I hated the name I had. It was so depressing. Yeah. Yeah. We and don't like that word just, loss. Once you realize that our loved ones are not lost, they're right here. That's it's just this term we use that doesn't really reflect reality. Right. So 
uh, that that was the starting point. She says, I'd love to do it. So we did it. We started it off. The early board member was comprised of the people who had been in the those first groups in uh, huh. in the Scottsdale area. And then it just started growing like crazy after a, a reasonable period of time. And today, uh, more than a decade later, we have 26,000 members. We have, I think, 165 affiliate chapter locations. And we have a conference, as you know, because you'll be there yeah. uh, every other year. That's going to draw 1,000 people, which is and, just And it's as we're recording this, it's nine months before the conference, and you've already sold 900 of the 1,000 tickets, which yeah, is... Yeah, there's not a lot of room left. And yeah. the last one we had, you know, I heard the hotel associates were really concerned that we we're going to be a depressing group, and this is going to be a real downer. And when we left, they said, you are the best best we've ever had. It yeah. was so uplifting. Yeah. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. I think, obviously, the presenters like yourself that brought so much hope and different perspectives to people, things they never considered or knew about before, helped create a shift. Them being together with other like-minded people who had been in the same boat. Yeah. And the third thing is, it's really hard to get men to <laughs> show their emotion, open up, and to... Um, to participate in a helping parents heal, but the wives took their husbands to the conference. So you had a lot of men there that would not have otherwise come. And so that really became a catalyst for our helping fathers heal uh, segment of helping parents heal. And it just took off. So, um, so much good has come from that. And uh, so that's kind of the origin of helping parents heal. And then today, you know, all the services provided are phenomenal. Not only do we have the local affiliates that people can attend those meetings, uh, Elizabeth and Irene Vuvalidis, who is your neighbor, I think, yeah. <laughs> a good friend and our VP. Absolutely. They, they run a series of Zoom meetings all the time, almost daily for people. So they're getting different speakers, presenters, mediums, uh, near-death experiencers, therapists, uh, that could really help. So those resources are there. We've got a bunch of videos um, of things that are helpful. So all those resources are there. And we have a provider list of mediums and other services as well. And so I actually started my own medium certification program independently in 2014. And it's still independent, but Helping Parents Heal uses me to vet mediums that want to become providers for Helping Parents Heal. So I want to ask you a question, Mark. I should have looked on, uh, for this on your site. Is your list of certified providers, mediums, on your website? It is. Um, oh. So there's a link to it on my website. It's actually a separate website. What is that website? Um, uh, again, there's a link to it from my site, but it is called, it's uh, findacertifiedmedium.com. Huh. Findacertifiedmedium.com. So You'll find probably most of the ones on there are also on the HVA provider list, but some of them are not because they just wanted certification for their own purposes, for their own ability to say on their websites they've been certified and linked to my site, um, and some aren't tied into HPH, but a lot of them are. What I love about your process is I have heard of other sites where the, somebody only needs to pay enough money and they get listed as a great psychic or medium on those sites. And it's hard to tell what the process is, but I personally know your process is rigorous. And I'd love if you share with people what the mediums on your list and therefore on the helpingparentsheal.org site have gone through. Sure. So this really started, um, the idea for it started after my first book, Soul Shift, came out, because then I was barrage of people saying, hey, do you know a medium I can go to that's good? And I, at the time, I knew maybe half a dozen, but a lot of them were high caliber, celebrity, well-known mediums with long wait lists, and some charged more than some people wanted to pay. And I thought to myself, you know, there's got to be more gifted people out there. They're just not identified yet. So that's what that was really the, the starting point for it. And then I reached out to two friends in the field of the research field for ideas. One was um, Dr. Emily Williams Kelly at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies. Um, that organization within the University of Virginia has done all kinds of near-death experience studies, reincarnation research. But Williams Kelly was doing research on mediums. Hmm. And I participated as a sitter for one of her experiments. And then afterward, I talked to her about her protocols. So I kind of built it around that. And then another friend of mine, Tricia Robertson, who uh, was the president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research, 
I bounced it against her and she kind of helped me refine it. And I've actually modified it several times to make it harder over the years. But essentially what we do is um, a medium that applies says, hey, I want to be certified. Uh, they have to go through five readings that are blinded, conducted via Zoom with no video. And they're not given the name of the sitter until the, the reading starts and only the first name. So they have to give the, the reading. Now, the, in the first stage of it, the medium just shares whatever they get. And then after five to 10 minutes, you know, if the sitter is allowed to provide some direction by saying, I'd like to hear from and then give a first name only. But that's really the extent, you know, and they can the sitters allowed to confirm like, yes, that's correct or no, but not really elaborate or feed the medium information. So we record these and then at the end they're transcribed and paragraphs would be converted into individual statements that can then be graded as correct, incorrect, indeterminable. Those are the three. And then if something's really special, they can give it a bonus and there's two level of bonus points. One is a two point bonus, one's a five. So hypothetically, let's just say that you're doing a reading for somebody and you say, okay, um, I believe I have your son here who's passed and I, I feel it's an A name and I feel a certain draw to pizza. And then, you know, so the, the person says, okay, A name, his name was Anthony. So that's, that's good. You know, I'll give you a, I'll give you a bonus for that too, but a two point bonus because you didn't get the name, you got the A um, and I did have a son pass, that's correct. And pizza, boy, that was his favorite food. I'll give you two for that. But let's say the medium says, okay, I've got a son who passed. His name was Anthony. His favorite food was pizza with pepperoni and bell pepper. Okay. Oh. Those get five point bonuses. Now, um, there's a lot of things too that are indeterminable. It could be a prediction about something that hasn't happened yet. You can't really grade it or a piece of information pertaining to someone they knew in Europe that you don't know and can't connect with and validate, that's not really going to be gradable. So we kind of set those to the side and we just grade the incorrect and correct and get a percentage accuracy. Now, with that said, if the indeterminable statements exceed 33%, in other words, if it's half indeterminable, that's not really a good reading. So at that point, if it's over 33% indeterminable, we grade the additional indeterminables as incorrect. So it's, it's heightened the standard a little. And at the end of the day, it takes 75 points for somebody to pass. And that's a combination of the percent accuracy and bonus points. So the worst somebody could do and pass, we, we require a minimum 65% accuracy. So they could be 65% accurate and have two of the five point bonuses. They get 75% or 75 points. They would just barely pass. Now I've had probably... At, eight to 10 people score in the nineties, uh, mid, you know, low to high nineties. So there are some outstanding people and some have eked by, but those are the standards that were set and they did the job, but, and a lot of them are right in the middle and that's more or less the protocol. Wow. And five readings. Do they have to get that score in all five readings? No, it's the average. Oh, okay. In fact, most of them, I'd say the majority have at least one bad reading or one that's not up to snuff with the standard of the others. It's not necessarily bad, but it just isn't yeah. as good. Or they may fail one reading. Uh, it's the overall result that counts. Yeah. Yeah, that's outstanding. Yeah. So I, I love that because uh, you're holding them to the, the test and the sitters have to be honest. And, and hopefully they pass. My test of a good reading is the sitter walks away and says, oh, my God, that was my loved one. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, I got to give Tricia Robertson credit for the five reading, because I was just going to say, what if we do two or three? Because I felt like I was asking too much of the medium to do five. She says, Mark, you really need that, you know, because you need that average over five. You need to see the consistency. If you only do one, you could have a great medium that has a bad day, or you could have a, a mediocre medium that has a really good day if you're just doing one. You need You need to see it over several. The other thing, Mark, and I know you know this, is that the fact that the mediums are in a test setting, a testing situation, that really puts an extra level of pressure on so that anybody that ex excels at that test is already good. So that's wonderful. I agree completely uh, because there are a lot of good mediums I know who have been reluctant to take it. They're just afraid of putting themselves under that. And uh, some of them that I know are good have come in and they just get in their own way because they're like, they're so worried about the result. It's like, how do you do a normal reading? 
It's not you talking. You're just a vessel, you know, just share what you get. You don't need to like interpret it. You don't need to overanalyze it. Just do your job like you would any other time. But you're right. So it's, it's really a gauntlet. If somebody can do this, then they can do it. Yeah, wonderful. You say that you've you participated in research at the University of Virginia, but I believe you also did at the University of Arizona. What was involved there? So this goes back to this kind of interesting. It was um, three weeks after Brandon's passing. I'm watching the the local news in Phoenix on the NBC affiliate, and they show this blurb about some research being conducted at the University of Arizona. And um, they're testing a um, medium under controlled blinded conditions with the sitters separated. And uh, the researcher, Gary, <laughs> was asking questions of the medium. And um, so I'm watching this thinking, wow, these this medium seems to be giving a lot of very specific information. And then they debriefed at the end of it, and um, it was very, very accurate. Well, the medium was Alison Dubois before the show Medium came out. Mm. And um, so I thought, geez, I'd love to have a reading with this woman. I'd love to be in that lab, too. Well, synchronicity appeared. The very next day, I get a, a call from a man named Jerry Conser, who had been friends with my father. He lived in Dallas, Texas. And he's like, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through, and I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name's Allison Dubon. Here's a phone number you can call. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. So I get that. And I had the reading with her eight months later. And there's some crazy stuff there, too. But um, it was February the following year that I was invited to go into the lab because I was writing Soul Shift, the first book at the time. And I had an editor out of New York who contacted the lab and asked about me getting in there. Well, it was a long time later, but I did eventually get in there. And the day that I went there was actually the day Discovery Channel was there to video what was going on and make uh, an excerpt out of it for a, for a show, which was pretty cool. Yeah. So I was the test sitter. Uh, there was a medium named Lori Campbell who was outstanding. And I just read an article about her today. Really? <laughs> I love so it's <laughs> yeah, with Dr. Gary Schwartz. So, so Lori wow. did a great job. Uh, it was recorded for Discovery Channel. And there's actually a clip of that on my website under the media tab. So when people go there, they can scope that out. It's only like two and a half, three minutes long. So they really condensed it down. But she did a great job. She couldn't see me. She wasn't allowed to converse with me until after a certain point at the end. Um, but that was my experience there. I never really saw the documentation that followed to know how it all graded out. But but um, it was a pretty cool experience for me to go through in that setting. And and again, that probably helped me in terms of my own program that I set up. And I'm not trying to be a science lab or anything. I'm not looking to write journal papers. I'm just trying to uh, be a public service and give people yeah. resources they can trust. I've invested all my own money in this. I don't charge a dime. Um, the mediums don't pay me anything. The sitters don't pay me anything. I've invested thousands of dollars and it's just a public service. It's that simple. Yeah. And raising the bar of mediumship, which is just fantastic. Yeah. I'm sorry. Everybody thanks you for that. Sure thing. Uh, so you said some crazy stuff came up. I, I don't like to use the word crazy in your <laughs> reading. Allison, was, did yeah. it have to be with Brandon? Well, part of it was with Brandon. Um, but, but the first thing was really with my dad. So uh, two weeks before the reading, a um, gentleman who knew my dad gave me a box and I'm like, I open it up and there's a manuscript in it, all eight and a half by 11 type pages. It's entitled Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by Richard Ireland. And 1973 was the date. I'm like, where'd you get this? He goes, well, your dad gave it to me before he passed. Oh, my God. He says, because you were out of state at the time. And I said, well, you've had my dad passed 12 years ago. Why are you giving this to me now? He says, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> So two weeks later, I meet with Allison. One of the first things she says to me is, well, I, your dad is here and he showed me a book, but I, I believe it's his book, but he's handing it to you to take forward. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I think I get that. And I've actually subsequently had that book published. So that was pretty cool to keep my dad's legacy going. Yeah, absolutely. I wish they hadn't waited so long, but yeah, good to I, have it. I, I had a lot of other affirmations from her and that. I mean, that's been a long time ago. But I recall her saying that our son was there congratulating us on our 25th wedding anniversary. And she didn't know anything about me when I came in there. We had just had our 25th anniversary two months earlier. Oh, nice. Um, she had talked about his lungs feeling like he was uh, son was drowning or a drown. 
and the autopsy physician had actually told me that um, Brandon's, uh, the way he, when he has a severe asthma attack of that extent, causes the lungs to expand to the point of nearly touching in the middle. And it only happens in cases of very severe asthma or drownings. So the sensation she got was pretty much identical to what that would be. There were a bunch of other things too that I can't even recall, but it, it was really outstanding. Um, so yeah, and it just kind of took me down this path. I met a lot of different top mediums from around the world, had different experiences with them, and then uh, just kind of branched off to uh, doing a lot of different things within the field. And then kind of combing with helping parents heal too, since we're the only organization of our type that allows the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence. And, and what a difference that makes. I was just talking to someone the other day about, I mean, support groups for bereaved people are wonderful, but the goal is to help people move beyond their grief and process their grief and find joy again. And some support groups, the people are as depressed 20 years later as when their loved one first died. And that is just not the way people who go along with Helping Parents Heal are. No, I think you're probably in the same uh, mind uh, thought of mind as I am in terms of why we're here. We're here to live a life, to have experiences, to experience joy and to grow. And if somebody shuts down like that, they're not able to do any of those things right. and not able to contribute either. So, yeah, I totally agree. And if, if, if people aren't getting out of an organization what they need, then they need to look elsewhere, I think, you know. Yeah. I think that's why we've had such explosive growth because it really, it does help people. I've seen people come in on the front end and leave on the back end in a much better place. Even the last time I was on your show, we talked about what I call the five pillars of healing and it all, you know, that's one of the pillars is that hope element um, that you get from being open to evidence for the afterlife. And that's, you know, could be from a variety of things. Initially, maybe people that don't have any exposure to this field, uh, it could be like reading books about it, or then, you know, maybe learning how to meditate and have a direct connection of some sort, doing EMDR, uh, getting a mediumship reading when they're ready. So, yeah, it, it makes a difference. So these five pillars, tell me again the title of what the five pillars are, and did you come up with them? I did. Th these are just things I observed with people that had come in in a very despondent way and left at a much better place. The first pillar, um, as I call it, is just the support pillar from family and friends. Not everybody has that, unfortunately, but if you do and people want to be a supportive family, most parents want to discuss their child. They don't want them to sweep that under the rug or try and avoid that topic. So uh, a supportive family and friends is huge. So yeah. you you mentioned children, and of course, that's because you're the co-founder of Helping oh, yeah. Parents Heal. But all of you listening, no matter who it is that you have across the veil, these are Mark's five pillars of healing. So support is going to be one of those pillars for, from sure. any situation. Yeah. So the first pillar is the support from family and friends, typically. The second pillar is meeting people who have been through the same thing as you and building relationships with those. And that's something we help provide because we link people together because no one else really knows what it feels like, you know, uh, unless you've been there. The third uh, pillar is service. And that's something somebody may not be able to do right away, but when they're emotionally at a point where they can, if you give to somebody else or some other uh, organization, it comes back to you. It helps you heal too. You, you might want to work in a soup kitchen. You might want to help the homeless. You might want to help with helping parents heal chapter. You know, it could be a variety of things. There's no one thing. But whatever, you know, providing service to someone else comes back to you. And also, I mean, it comes back to you, but it also gets your mind off of, woe is me. Yeah. yeah. Turn your focus outward. And for a while, you experience peace, and that just heals your whole energy field. Totally. Yep. The fourth pillar, I give a lot of credit to Ernie Jackson for, um, and it's to, well, the second part of it. The first part is letting go of feelings of guilt, because a lot of folks will say, you know, I should have known, I could have stopped it, I could have done this, I could have done that, or, you know, I should have seen the signs, it's my fault. You got to let go of that, because in the vast majority of cases, there's nothing you could do. You can't control destiny. Things are going to happen, and, and you're not responsible for that. So let go of that, because it's just hurting you. 
The other part of that is letting go of feelings of anger and lack of forgiveness for someone you're holding personally accountable for that. Whether it be a medical professional you're blaming, someone involved in an accident that took your loved one's life. Um, I'm not saying that's easy. It's a hard thing to do. And I'm not telling you you have to do it. I'm just saying if you can do that, it will help you because it's hurting you. You're the one being hurt by that. And the reason I brought up Ernie is because he has a remarkable story of when his son was killed in an accident sitting while they were parked because a young lady fell asleep at the wheel. She wasn't inebriated or anything. She just fell asleep. She was working too many hours and she was a student. And he instantly forgave her. And he said, don't think that I'm, <laughs> it's because I'm such a great person. He said, it's because I knew it would hurt me. He recognized that and he forgave her right away. Most of us could never do that. I don't think it would be very hard. It would take time. But that's the fourth pillar. And the fifth one we already talked about, the hope hope pillar. And that comes from an openness to the idea that we're a soul, not a body. We're a soul in a body, like occupying a body for physical experiences while we're here on this planet for a set period of time. And that soul continues on. And, it, and, um, and there's a lot of evidence to support that. There sure is. And a lot of it thanks to you. No. And that leads right into the fact that you have a new book out. You keep talking about your first book, Soul Shift. Tell us about the new one. Yeah, it's called The Persistence of the Soul. Mm-hmm. And it, um, it's a little bit different. The first one is more a memoir, kind of journaling my, uh, I guess, my re-entry into my dad's field and all the experiences I had and the evidence that we called along the way, not just with mediums, but direct personal experiences. This one um, continues the personal narrative and shares those experiences, but it's, a, but it's a little different about this one. It also incorporates research and the science backing and supporting the things that I share. Um, and I'm, I'm going all the way back to the old stuff for the Society of Psychical Research back to the 18, 1882 when they were founded. Um, people, A lot of people don't know this, but some of the most preeminent scientists in the world were involved in that organization back then, and it still exists today. I'm smiling because that's also what I was reading this morning, totally separate from you about William James, who happens to come to me in meditation rather frequently. (laughs) He's one of those. He He founded that, I believe. Well, he founded the American SPR. So there's the the original ones in London, the the SPR, the Society of Psychological Research in London, and they have a journal that comes out periodically. Mm -hmm. And then William James really worked with them a lot and partnered, and he founded the ASPR, the American Society of Psychical Research. So they were kind of hand in hand, hand in glove kind of organizations. And, um, you know, even to this day, the what are regarded as the most compelling evidence supporting um, mediumship as a form of evidence for afterlife are what are called the cross correspondence experiments. And I don't know if you're familiar with those. Share them with us. Yeah. So, um, they, I think there's been more than one. There's been a series of those. But the, the earliest ones I can recall was one of the early founders of the SPR had passed away. And within a short period of time, there were various mediums that the SPR had worked with all around the world, different places that were getting messages, but they were like incomplete. Like um, they didn't make any sense. And then they all were joined together at the SPR and it formed a mosaic. So there was a very significant message formed by all these various ones uh, put together it, it formed this this message and and you know mark this is really fascinating because in last week's messages of hope podcast i formed a panel of four other professional mediums and we made the point that each medium is going to get different pieces of the puzzle related relating to any spirit across the veil and here you are saying that they've actually you know validated this with these very reputable societies, research societies. Yeah, it, you know, what the reason why it's considered the most compelling is it, it number one eliminates the theory of telepathy with a sitter. And number two, um, you know, there's a there are some people that say, okay, I believe in ESP or psychic phenomena, but there's no proof that that message came from somebody who's deceased. It could have been beyond telepathy, just clairvoyance or the Akashic records or something like that, where you're able to call information like that. This was more complex to where it demonstrates some intelligence beyond our understanding is providing all these pieces to be put together the certain way that then form this uh, mosaic of a message. So that's why, because it it kind of 
it does the best job of defeating those arguments against mediumship as evidence of post-mortem survival of consciousness. And where do we find information on these? Are these in your book? Um, I do, yeah. My uh, Persistence of the Soul, I have uh, a lot of information on that. Now, it's it's a few cases, and it gives an explanation of those. Also, I talk about more modern research, like what Winbridge is doing, what uh, the S SPR did, uh, the Society of Psychical Research in Scotland did. My friend Tricia Robertson and Archie Roy, who was one of the most preeminent scientists in the UK before his passing, had conducted a highly detailed, very elaborate experiment with a panel of mediums, including Gordon Smith, who you met at our last conference and who will be back. And it was just phenomenal. Uh, it's, I guess a brief explanation is they took a bunch of sitters, put them into a room, and they pre-numbered seats, and they sent people in, and the people didn't know where they would be seated. But there was a number under each seat. And then they bring mediums into an adjacent room where they weren't in the same room and they had to speak through a microphone and then give what they got. And, and in Gordon's case, I believe it was, uh, he delivered something to the effect of um, the person sitting at number 14 lives on Christmas Cottage Lane. And that turned out to be correct. So the end result of this was phenomenally successful. Mm. Um, so I, I talk about all these different experiences, not just the really old ones, but all through, you know, right now. And I, the other thing I talk about is there should be more of this, but it's underfunded. Um, we're still, unfortunately, living in a world where academia is uh, married to materialism and physicalism. And um, until that shifts, it's going to be hard to put the dollars that we pay as taxpayers into universities for research studies to focus on these things, which are really probably the most important for anyone to consider. Oh, there's, there's no doubt of the, the benefits of coming to the understanding that life is eternal, go so far beyond simply healing from grief, which is huge in itself. Yeah, because people not only have to deal with the passing of a loved one, recognize their own mortality and not to fear that death and let that rule their life um, so that all the way through they're just, you know, living half a life. Yeah. So is there part of your father's work in your new book? And part of what you've learned, what what else is in the book? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's more. Uh, so we've got, um, I've got a chapter on how to, actually, we were talking about this, how to uh, identify fraudulent mediums and avoid them and how to find a good one. Oh, good. Um, I've got a chapter on an experiment I conducted with my sister before her passing where she shared a secret message. I've got a chapter on religion and the history of psychic phenomena, mediumship, and other gifts of the spirit as they're viewed by various religious traditions. And I put that in there mainly because I think a lot of folks, especially in the US, that were brought up in maybe a more traditional or fundamentalist Christian upbringing have some fear or trepidation about this. I, and, I'd love to talk about that because yeah. we, we put up some shorts, uh, short videos in advance of this panel of mediums that I told you about. And that garnered oh, a little smattering of the standard comments we get on any video about mediums of how wrong that is from a religious standpoint. There are always these people that I truly feel are coming from a place of ignorance. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just a factual ignorance of what mediumship is really about and fear. So I'd love to hear some of the points that you make in that chapter. Well, it is fear and it is ignorance, but it's actually ignorance of their own scripture. Because um, I think most of these folks buy what they know about scripture is what they hear from their pastor in a, in a reader's digest fashion. And it also reflects those ideas sifted through the perspective of that pastor or other parishioners who have certain mindsets about this stuff. And really, here's where I guess what I'd say is my dad, he, you know, he was a minister and he would share Jesus's teachings and talk about things out of scripture, um, especially the gifts of the spirit, which are noted in uh, Corinthians one chapter 12 by the apostle paul and all the things he listed are these very things okay they're there the problem is the old testament going way back had these um basically disparaged mediums um uh, in some of the like leviticus and deuteronomy but you have to realize these were written by people who were trying to um fight for the minds of people who had there were other groups out there at the time fighting for people's minds and hearts 
um, within these same chapters that say, oh, you shouldn't see mediums or mediums should be, you know, uh, stoned to death or whatever. They also say, well, uh, if you have a disobedient son, you need to take him to an adjacent town to be stoned to death. Um, any adulterer should be stoned to death. If you touch the skin of a pig, you should be stoned to death. So to me, it's like, okay, can we use our rational thinking here a little bit and just say, is that really the word of God? I mean, or is that more of a human um, excerpt, you know, of, of that period of time where someone's trying to lead a group of people in a very structured way? Um, that's how I see it. Moving to the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, there's a story about the medium of Endor, who um, the leader of the, of the Hebrew tribe at the time, Saul, had because he had become kind of a bad guy, he had lost his connection to God in dreams. So he goes to a medium, he seeks out a medium, but he had an edict out there that any mediums would be killed because it's against the law. But he actually goes to a medium because he's trying to connect. So this medium shares with him, he she brings through two biblical figures and, and shares information with him. But I, I think so more in the New Testament, it's really common. I mean, um, you have Jesus in the transfiguration story, talking to two deceased people in the view of the disciples. Um, you have him talking to a woman at a well and telling her a lot of things that he should know, except through clairvoyance. Um, and then you have the apostle Paul talking about the gifts of the spirit. Some people will say, well, that's fine for Jesus, but that's different. But no, I mean, in, in John's gospel, it says he's quoted saying all the works I do, you shall do and greater works than these. So, that's kind of my answer, but I look at it, I don't look at uh, scripture in a real literal way either, you know. I think you have to address people where they're coming from. So I try and do it from two two different angles. Yeah. One I is more of a rational, that. yeah. And one is more like, okay, here's where you're at, here's your scripture, here's what it says about it. Why don't you consider this? Yeah, I'm I'm glad you did because I was not raised reading the Bible. My parents just didn't bring religion into our family. And so I never had that fear. I learned just through the personal experience of connecting with spirit and, and seeing how healing it is to go to a medium and now being a medium, how incredibly life-changing and healing it is to receive. Where, where do people think that these ideas come from? It was people like you, people like my dad back in history. Now, some of them may be claiming to be prophets and maybe some were better than others. I don't know. But um, I think the thing is, for some reason, we overvalue scripture and, and undervalue our own direct connection to the divine. That's the thing. That's where we got to get to. Is like you're given guidance. Every one of us has intuition, and we're given guidance uh, to do to which way to go, to what things to do and not do. And we know what's right and wrong in our heart. You know, you don't need somebody to tell you that. You know it inside you. Can I give you a big amen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Well, what stories haven't you shared with us yet that, that people would just love to hear? Because we love the stories. I think one of my favorites, this goes back to just six months after Brandon's passing. So two months after he passed, I saw an intuitive, I wouldn't call her a medium, but um, she was a very sincere, nice woman. She was a nurse full time, and then she did readings on the side. And one of the things she said was, within six months, you're going to see Brandon at the side of your bed. Well, six months later, we were about to go on a cruise, um, a seven day cruise, and we were going to celebrate Brandon's graduation from high, from high school. But since he couldn't be there with us physically, we took our older son, Steve, and we took Brandon's best friend, Stu. Well, before we left, we got a call from a friend, James Linton. Now, James is somebody who actually had been hiking on the mountain the day of Brandon's passing. He came up on their group and tried to help, but he was there too late and couldn't help. But he'd left a message in an online obituary with his contact information, said, hey, I was there. If you want to talk, call me. Well, we did. We got to know them, became friends. And so six months later, he's like, hey, and he was a musician, guitar player, composer, singer, and he had an in-home studio. He goes, I'm, I'm working on this new album. Could I borrow Brandon's bass? And uh, it's actually right there behind me. It's that blue one in the middle. The oh, other two guitars are mine. Yeah. So... We said, sure, you can borrow the bass. So we loan him the bass. We go on our cruise. The day we get back, after a week, Susie, my wife, goes to our bed and sits at the foot of our bed. And while she's sitting there, all of a sudden, she feels another presence. And she actually sees a shadow figure out of her peripheral vision. 
and she knows it's Brandon. So she tell, tells me about this. We're just thrilled. We're over the moon. Well, the next day, James calls us. He goes, hey, Susie, I've got something to tell you, but I don't know how to tell you. She thought he'd broken the bass, oh. but it wasn't that. He's like, I was in the studio um, putting this song together, and all of a sudden, I felt another presence in there with me. And then I saw a shadow figure out of my peripheral vision. Oh. Then I saw sh uh, bright lights flashing. I thought I was hallucinating, so I went and took a shower. I got water. I ate something. But every time I came back, it was stronger and stronger. And then finally, I said, okay, Brandon, what do you want? And he said at that point, um, he was guided to redo the lyrics and bass line of the song. It's called The Other Side. He said, it's the best song I've ever written, but I didn't write it. Oh. And that song's on my website, too. People can find that a clip of him doing that. But um, just the mere fact of him having the identical experience of Susie the day after, I mean, how much more evidence could you ask for? That is awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So Susie's been a believer all along, too, I assume. Yeah, she was raised in a more traditional uh, Christian background as a Lutheran, but she, you know, she met my dad early on on our second date. I actually took her to see him because oh. I, I was like running late. I was 19 years old and it was at the last minute. I'm like, well, do you want to go see a movie? Do you want to go to a disco or do you want to go see my dad? Oh, goes, oh let's go do that. So um, my father's demonstration of psychic phenomena consisted of taking 10 strips of Johnson Johnson medical tape, which is completely opaque and very strong adhesive, putting it all over his eyes, three black opaque blindfolds over that, and then two strips of tape below so no one could accuse him of looking down. And it was really more for effect because he gave so much more information than anyone would write down a piece of paper. It wouldn't have mattered. So people would write questions and send them up and he would answer them. So we get there. We're late. He's already blindfolded. He's already doing his readings. He doesn't know we're coming. I'm coming unannounced. So I said, well, why don't you write a question? And she goes, well, what? I said, just ask something about the future. So she wrote, um, will my mom get married? Well, her mom had been divorced for a number of years, was dating a guy, but had been noncommittal. He wanted to get married. And she was kind of saying, well, we'll see about that. So she sends that message up. A while later, my dad grabs her paper. It says, uh, Susie Sep Soup. And she's, oh, Susie Sype. He goes, close enough. And he says, well, you've asked me about your mother. And if you're going to be, uh, if she's going to get in, be getting married, my dear. Well, I don't know he's about your mother. This, he's getting this telepathically. He can't see. Oh, yeah. Paper. Yeah. Huh. Like, remember the ball against the wall as a kid? Yeah. 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 So he, he, he actually had, it like, x-ray clairvoyance or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so he, he's like, um, so I believe you've asked me about your mother. Uh, I don't know about your mother, my dear, but you've made your choice of men and he's with you tonight. And then I spoke up and I'm saying, uh, Dad, this is Mark. Susie's my date. He goes, oh, my gosh, I just married off my own son. Oh, my gosh. That was I remember second that date. story from before, but I'd completely forgotten it. Yeah. Wow. But, uh, but just to give you a feel for that, um, there's a man named Helmut Schmidt. He was second in command at the Duke Parapsychology Lab working for um, J.B. Ryan. And that lab ran from, I think, 30, 1932 to 1972 or something like that. Well, he had actually, um, Schmidt had attended one of my dad's demonstrations somewhere. I don't know where, but there was an article about it in the Tuscaloosa, Alabama newspaper in 1972. And basically what he said was, you know, we've done a lot of good work in this lab, but I think we could have even done better if we brought in professional psychics. But I think Ryan was afraid of being tricked or something, or he was afraid of getting pushback from skeptics. But anyhow, Schmidt says, and as an example, he says, I saw this uh, psychic, Richard Ireland. And he said, so I did my own experiment. He says, I went to a table of people. I said, give me a number. First table, give him three. Then he said, went to the next table, give me a number. Eight. Next table, give me a number. Five. He wrote three, eight, five. Then he folded it, put it in a sealed envelope. And, and then he wrote on the outside, tell me what's inside without opening the envelope. He sent it up to my dad. And my dad gets his envelope. Oh, you want to know what's inside? It's number 385 in red ink. And the guy, then he's like in the article, just says, this is incalculable odds against chance. So that's what I grew up with, <laughs> for what it's worth. The best of the best, really, just awe-inspiring. Uh, wow. And, and Gordon Smith saw the video of my dad on Steve Allen. He said it. He says, your dad was totally dialed in, totally. And it reminded him of Albert Best, I guess, who was his mentor. Yeah, Albert Best was a postman in England who was a medium, and he would 
discern deceased people's address. They would tell him where they live because that was his special, you know, he dealt with addresses. So that's what he was good at getting exact yeah. street numbers, the street. Oh, cool. Did your dad take this for granted or was he really interested in how and why he had that ability? He, he had a deep interest. He was a, a pretty intelligent man in addition to having the ability. He did a lot of deep studies on his own. He was well read, you know, and even in his book, the manuscript I mentioned earlier, he refers to a lot of the research and the people who were doing the research at the time and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so we show that it's real. We know that. But do you know how he explained it? You mean the phenomena itself? Yeah. You know, I don't even know that he knew 100 percent other than, you know, he would explain the difference between clairvoyance and telepathy and these things. But, but he had his own description of the levels of the level of the emotional was the bottom and then the intuition and then the psychic and then the mediumship, this level of spirit. And then the top was he called the level of a oneness, like you're a one with everything. Um, but as far as mechanics behind it, I, I'd have to go back and look at that. I think one of the things that he explained, because even though I, I believe consciousness is primary and it's, you know, not a brain caused phenomenon, the brain doesn't create consciousness, consciousness creates everything. And, um, but we do live in a physical world. We have a brain that filters and mediates our existence in this world. And the one thing he did mention, I remember, is something called the pineal gland or pineal gland, which I guess is a peanut-sized gland in the middle of our brain. And that's long been thought to be kind of the spirit uh, radio station, if you will, that connects us in this body to, to the other part of ourselves and to spirit and to everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I've heard it said, like for people that have near-death experiences, you know, once, you're out, once your soul is outside the brain, you're so expanded in terms of your knowledge and awareness. So this, it, I think, you know, we have a brain and, and we live in this form because it filters it down so that we could have these set experiences. We'd be so distracted. Otherwise, we'd never be able to get anything done, probably. That's the truth, right? It would be chaos if we could tune into all of the energy and information that's around us. Yeah. So that was the one thing he referenced that he thought it was a viable explanation, maybe for how these things work with people. But no one's really come up with a mechanical explanation. I know at times somebody had purported, oh, it's it's an electromagnetic wave, so telepathy is just like this wave, like a radio wave. That's not the case at all. They put people in Faraday cages, including my dad, from my understanding, at UCLA when they had a lab, and they were still able to get all this information. Well, how, you know, if you're blocking all radio signals, it's something beyond that. And I think it's it probably ties into the quantum realm, you know. I, uh, I, a, I know. This is my passion, digging there's, into There's that. a realm beyond this. We're, we're like the projection of it, I think. Um, and that other realm is all one place at one time. And the thing that really, I mean, in talking about quantum theory, um, entanglement is, is, a, is a feature of quantum theory that's really mind-boggling because what it states is like, two particles that have ever come into contact in a special way can be separated as far apart as the opposite ends of the universe and whatever happens to one is instantaneously reflected in the other. Well, it would take about 20 billion years to cross the universe, the phys known physical universe, at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. So that tells me beyond what we see here, this time-space thing that we're in, there's got to be something that's completely unified. Um, and everything's instantaneous. Even my dad's descriptions in trance states of what the afterlife is like very much sounds like that. You're you're there in a thought. But it's more of a thought world. Right. Um, and people, it's not about what you achieved here, what you did. It's who you are inside, you know, and that the you glow brighter or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You're probably in concert with those kinds of concepts, I would imagine. Awesome. The, you know, the truth with a capital T does not change over the years. Yeah. No. yeah. I love that you're carrying on your father's legacy. I don't know how you do it with, uh, you know, with the, your regular day job and being on the board of Helping Parents Heal. I know that uh, Elizabeth and Irene also on the board and other board members work tirelessly for that organization. Well, those two in particular do most of the work. I have to give them kudos because they are the organization. They put so much into it, their heart and soul every day. And they are going to, we keep telling them they're going to have to at some point, you know, accept some help and let people do other things to delegate. 
but it's hard to do, you know, because such a personal connection with people. But I guess you just have to find other people who are able to communicate that way and bring them in and delegate to them and, and share that responsibility. Well, I'm sure glad that, that you brought your idea to Elizabeth and she said yes and the timing was right because together you all of you involved in that organization have helped tens of thousands. And with your books now, you know, just reaching around the globe with this very important message that love never dies. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. It's been a fun discussion. It sure has. I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as we have. And we'll see you back here next week. Before you run off, can I have a second of your time and share with you the great news that just today we announced that my new book, The Awakened Way, Making the Shift to a Divinely Guided Life, is now available online for pre-order. In the first day that we announced this, it achieved number one new bestseller status on Amazon.com. We're running a great promotion in which we give away beautiful gifts for pre-ordering the book, including earning points for some really special awards just for taking the time to order in advance. The book will be out April 30th. And when it does, you're going to find out how you can make the connection with higher consciousness, why it's possible for anyone to connect with loved ones across the veil, with guides, and even angels. This is a truly inspired book that I hope will inspire you to learn to live the awakened way, one filled with peace, joy, and a sense of connection, not only with each other, but with all that is. People have been asking me for years, when are you going to share the how-tos of what you do? And I do it in this book. Find out details about the giveaways and how you can pre-order the book on my website, right on the homepage is a link, or go directly to www.theawakenedway.org. Thanks so much for being part of this community.